Welcome to another edition of 15241 Today Talk, subtitled Jim and Lanny on Stage, and we're recording today from the Boyce Middle School stage. Our director and producer is Glenn Ward, our coordinating producer, Linda Dzinski. And uh, we've been fortunate, Jim and I have been fortunate, the shows that we've recorded, uh, a lot of them have been with uh, good friends of ours. And today, D. Michael Fisher, a federal judge, is with us, Dennis Michael Fisher, uh, who was for a number of years uh, in the uh, State House of Representatives, State Senator, Attorney General, and uh, let me start by saying that, uh, Michael, I will always be deeply indebted to you. Uh, when my son David graduated from John Carroll University with a degree in criminal justice, you were kind enough to hire him as a member of your Attorney General's uh, unit, and thanks for doing that for us, and thanks for being on the show today. Well, first of all, great to be here with two longtime friends who uh, I got to know from living here in Upper St. Clair. What is it about Upper St. Clair that makes this community so special? Oh, it, it really a great community, uh, diverse, great people, uh, terrific school district, uh, just, you know, a community that uh, so many good people lived in over the years, and I'm proud to say that uh, I made it my home for uh, almost uh, 70 years of my life, uh, and uh, it's, it's just a great community. A lot of, it seems to me that a lot of famous people uh, ended up living in Upper St. Clair. Well, they did, uh, but uh, maybe Upper St. Clair gave them a lot of fame. Maybe that's how they became famous, but it was a great community. Uh, it was a great place for our kids to live, first of all. Uh, the kids got a great education. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they grew up with uh, uh, other students who were striving to be the best. They had terrific teachers, and they had good opportunities in, in the community as a whole. Do you remember the first time you and Jim uh, made contact with one another? Well, it was probably uh, on the football field. Uh, you know, he came in. Uh, I was a long time, not a long time resident, but uh, a resident here. And I was in, uh, I had probably been, I'd been at that time in the state house. And a brash new coach came to Upper St. Clair High School, <laughs> Jim Render. Uh, I, had known, I had known his uh, predecessor, his the predecessor once before him, Joe Moore, a little bit. Uh, Joe was a gregarious guy that a lot of people would know. Uh, I got to meet uh, Joe through, uh, uh, I remember through a, a longtime friend, Bill Chapani, was close to, to Joe Moore. And the Chapanis were very prominent in Upper St. Clair football days. Right. And then they brought in Jim Render, and it was, I think, through the Chapanis that I first got to meet you. I remember Joe Moore said to me one time, you had 10 years of the Chapanis. That's that, he says, you deserve a lot of, uh, uh, he said, if, if you've got 100 penalty flags, you deserve to win them all. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was a character, and so was Fuddy Chapani. Yeah. You know? and, and his brother Bill. Uh, and they had, there was a, you know, it was an example of uh, the uniqueness of the people that came up through this community, but great football players that both you and Coach Moore had. Uh, during that era. As a public servant and campaigning, did you find yourself going to a lot of football games on Friday nights, whether it be at St. Clair or other community stops? Well, I did. Uh, uh, I went primarily uh, to the St. Clair games, though. Uh, and I did what I still do today, even at a grandchild's uh, sporting event. I stand in the back. I can't sit. I stood in the back with some legendary uh, characters, fans, and fathers of uh, Jim's uh, players. Uh, and uh, it was a good way to uh, communicate with people. And, you know, people would come up and, you know, what's going on? But we don't like this, we don't like that. That would divert their attention from the football game for a little bit to complain about something that was going on in state government. But occasionally I you know, adventured to the other communities, but uh, uh, I, was, I was more loyal to the St. Clair games than any others. Mike, you deserve a tremendous amount of credit for the dedication uh, you've put forth as someone that wanted to help communities and be a public servant. When was it that you decided that this, is, this was going to be your career? Well, you know, I, I sort of, uh, I was uh, just starting out. I, I had been an assistant DA for five years here in Allegheny County. 
And I actually got recruited by the then chairman of the Republican Committee in Upper St. Clair, Frank Bolte, a great gentleman, who recruited me uh, to run against the then incumbent, 1974. And uh, I sort of thought sometime I'd like to get into the legislative process. Uh, and I had just been married. I went home. I told Carol, I said, Mr. Bolte asked me if I'd run uh, against Jay Wells for the legislature. She said, well, you know, geez, how are you going to do that? Don't you have to go to Harrisburg? Uh, and we talked about it, and Carol was very supportive, as she always was throughout my career. So I sort of got into it by uh, being recruited to it. But once I got there, I realized that, uh, you know, I could help the communities. I, I could help the state. I enjoyed what I was doing. It gave me time to continue practicing law. Uh, yeah, because the job was and essentially still is part-time, and I think that's the way it should be. So it was, it was a great career, and I, I enjoyed being with people and getting to meet people and working with people. And uh, I represented, uh, you know, I always represented Upper St. Clair, but there are a number of rather fine communities uh, adjacent to Upper St. Clair that was a good place to uh, be from. Mike, uh, I, I know you'll agree with me when I say that uh, Pam Render is the prototypical uh, coach's wife. Your wife, Carol, prototypical uh, public servant, politician's wife. She's a, a remarkable person. I've watched over the years how much she's gone out and helped you and supported you and cared about the communities. Yes, and I mean, she has this likewise had the same interests, and uh, you know she had, she was the. Uh, she was the caregiver for our kids when they were growing up. When I was traveling up to Harrisburg, uh, you know, two or three nights a week for, you know, 30, 40 uh, weeks a year, and that was tough on her. But she enjoyed getting out and meeting people, and uh, that's how we met all of you. In fact, it was through Carol that we met Lanny. I mean, Lanny was the voice of the pirates, but it was really through Carol that uh, that I met Lanny and we became friends. 1980. Nine, we won the state championship, and one of the thrills of that whole process was uh, you, as a state senator, invited that team up to Harrisburg for a little recognition. You recall all that? I, I, I do recall that, and we had you over the state house and the Senate, and you know that was a big thing. Uh, it really was. Yeah, yeah, I found some pictures not too long ago when I was cleaning out my office from that day. Well, we, we were, you know, we were proud to have uh, your team up. And uh, I remember everybody uh, realized that uh, St. Clair had a great football program. And there was somewhat of a surprise because of the size of the school. I mean, we think it's a big school, but it wasn't a big, it was never a big school district. Uh, and, uh, you know, your, uh, your coaching, uh, expertise it was be beginning to get some attention uh, statewide so people recognized you and I remember in the Senate I always had a, a friend of mine Jim Rhodes who was a state senator from up in Schuylkill County and I think he was a good friend it was uh, it was it George Curry uh, yes. from Berwick Berwick and uh, they always thought they were entitled to win the state championship every year and that, that was sort of like the rite of passage and he was surprised when I brought you up because he said that Upper St. Clair School District, that's a small one. He <laughs> said they're not as tough as our boys, but they, wanted, they were a good team. You, you might not remember this, but uh, our own Perry High School, Pittsburgh, uh, beat Berwick the afternoon of, of our state championship game, which was at night. Perry, it was a frozen field, and Perry upset them. And, and they weren't, Berwick wasn't, wasn't very happy. Yeah. You know. I remember that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, um, how did you decide when you, you were going to take the next step from being a member of the House of Representatives to become a state senator? Uh, once again, I got recruited. Uh, a Democrat had uh, won the seat in 1976. And uh, I, Carol and I will remember this. We were at a Penn State game. And uh, Henry Hager, who was a Republican leader of the Senate, who's from up around the Penn State area, came up to me and he said, we're going to run you for the state Senate. And Carol said, oh, you are? And he says, yeah. And he said, uh, well, if, we, if you run, we'll win. And uh, that was how it got started. And I, I was, after about six years, I was thinking, you know, I'm not sure how long I'm going to stay in the state house. It was a, it was a somewhat, a, you know, you had 203 members, it was a big body. It took a while to get to any leadership role, and 
So the invitation was sort of good news to my ear. I figured, why not take a shot? I was willing to run the risk, run in a bigger district, and, and I was successful. As a legislature, a member of the legislature, were there a couple of things, laws that you passed that you're most proud of? Yeah, a couple, and a couple that you know, very. One of the things that I did when I, I got to the Senate, I became a committee chairman in the Environmental Resources and Energy Committee. Uh, immediately, it would have taken me 12, 14 years to be, become a chair in the House. In the Senate, I became a chair right away, and I was involved in the mid '80s in uh, bringing recycling to Pennsylvania, and uh, I was a sponsor of the bill. It uh, changed a couple times coming through uh, a committee, but uh, we hammered out uh, the, the legislation, which in essence required the people of Pennsylvania to recycle in, in the mid 80s. And people would tell me that'll never happen. People would tell me on the streets, uh, like maybe at the back of a football game, that'll never happen. People are never gonna do this. I talked to my kids. I remember talking to my kids who were then in grade school. I said, what do you think about doing? Oh, that's something that people ought to be doing. They ought to be recycling, taking garbage or taking plastic and uh, glass and cardboard and paper out of the waste cycle. So it was the young people that really made their parents do it, but it worked. It took so much out of the normal trash. We were able to upgrade our landfills across the state, and it really made a difference. Uh, you know, so much now, and I'm sure the people uh, who will be watching this realize uh, there's a glut of glass. You can't recycle glass anymore because there's so much glass that's uh, in the system, and and that's a shame. Somehow, uh, you know, they got to come a uh, they, they got to figure out a, another end use for glass to get it out of the garbage and back into the recycling. So, of all the things that maybe I did, uh, that was something that probably had the longest and. Uh, most far-reaching uh, result legislatively. Then the decision to run for attorney general. Yeah, that was uh, that was one where I was in finishing my fourth term in the Senate. I was in the middle of my fourth term, and uh, I, I had been there. That would have been I think would have been my twentieth, twentieth or twenty-second year in the legislature, and. Uh, I decided that uh, I'd like to run statewide, and the, the Attorney General's office was a great office. It gave me an opportunity to put my legal background to work in an office that, uh, you know, had a, it was political because you had to get elected to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I decided to mount a campaign in 1996, and uh, it wasn't easy. It's a, this is a tough state to run in statewide. This is not Rhode Island where you, know, you can get everywhere in Rhode Island in the middle, you know, in one day. You can hit all, this is, this is a really tough state, 67 counties. And, uh, you know, I, w I was able to, to win a tight election and get reelected in 2000. And uh, uh, it, was a, it, it was a great job. It was a terrific job to be the state's AG. Did you enjoy campaigning? I enjoyed campaigning. I, I you know, I didn't enjoy I'm not so sure I enjoyed getting in a car and driving five hours to a picnic. <laughs> but that's what you had to do if it was uh, an important enough uh, you know, group of people. Uh, and, but I, I enjoyed seeing the diversity of the state. I'll never forget I was up in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, and you know, all of us being pirate fans, because of course Lanny was the voice of the pirates. And I knew in Philadelphia there were Philadelphia fans. I was up in Monroe County, which is, you know, as people would recognize it, in the Poconos. But it's tucked up there pretty close to New York, and New York was growing. I couldn't believe it. One day I was on campaign, all these people were in New York Yankee hats. You know, what's this? <laughs> and what I found out were a lot of people who were New Yorkers had moved into uh, Strasburg and Pocono Manor and all those areas but they kept their allegiance to the Yankees. And that, and that really taught you uh, how big this state was. Yeah. How about telling the story of our uh, baseball, uh, you brought up baseball, of our uh, baseball coaching career. Oh. <laughs> you guys coach together? Yeah. Well, uh, let, let Mike tell it. 
Well, our kids, uh, Jim's son, Eric, and my son, Brett, same age, playing travel baseball. They were probably about uh, maybe 12 years old. And uh, they were a pretty good team, pretty good team of you know young baseball players. They were about 12 years old. And we usually played Mount Lebanon, Bethel, teams in this area, Peters. So uh, Bill McGardle was our was the coach, and Bill was a, a well-known uh, FBI agent uh, from Pittsburgh. And his son Mac went on to become uh, maybe the only four-year starting quarterback on Jim's uh, uh, teams. Exactly. And uh, so our team went out. They ventured out to a tournament in Weirton, and it was a late afternoon tournament. And I was one of the assistant coaches. Jim was not because I was the scorekeeper. He was scorekeeper. But, but he wasn't able, you know, different times, and I was, I was on the bench. So that day, Bill couldn't be there. Something happened. Something broke with the FBI. Bill couldn't be there, so I was the head coach. And uh, as I remember it, uh, you know, the kids were getting a, a job by the Empire. We were in Weirton, and a team from Upper St. Clair. <laughs> Just it seemed like they weren't going to win in Weirton. <laughs> That's what it seemed. And as the, I think the last play of the game, my son was playing, Brett was playing third base. Bases were loaded. Eric Render was catching. Balls hit to uh, Brett. He comes home with it. Bases loaded. He comes home with it. Eric's standing on home plate. Beats the runner. The runner's out. Okay? The inning should be over. It should have gone to extra innings. Umpire says, safe. <laughs> so I went up. Uh, he touched, he, he beat him by five feet. The throw beat him by five feet. He says he didn't tag him. I said, he didn't tag him. He didn't have to tag him. It was a force play. He says, you're out of here. So over the fence, coming to my assistance comes the person who we've seen in Upper St. Clair confront those officials as, uh, as, as part of his job. And uh, he didn't do any better than I did. Is that how you remember it? I remember you leading the way, and I was right behind you. We jumped over the bench to go get this umpire. And then later on, I thought, boy, if that would have got in the news, uh, I can't remember if you were the attorney general. No, I was a just a senator. senator. I was a senator. <laughs> and the coach. <laughs> but we were right, weren't we? Oh, no question. There was no, there was no question Upper St. Clair was going to lose that game. It was just a question of how they were going to lose that mm. game. Thus ended our baseball coaching, coaching career. career. <laughs> Bob Prince. He helped you with the witch campaign? Uh, Bob Prince, boy, uh, you know, uh, Bob, the gunner was, uh, uh, the gunner was uh, gone as the voice of the pirates. You had, re you and Milo Hamilton, I guess, had replaced him in the yes. late 70s. Yes. And, uh, but he was still around, as, as you knew. And uh, uh, I was a young member over at St. Clair Country Club, and uh, my father uh, knew the gunner pretty well. And gunner was around St. Clair a lot. So I, I got to know him. He'd call me kid, you know. And uh, so I was running for the Senate. And uh, it was, as I described a little bit before, it was, you know, it was going to be a tough race. And uh, uh, I, I said to him, I said, uh, Mr. Prince, I said, would you consider doing a radio ad for me? And he said, anything, kid, anything. Just tell me where you want me to be. And I, they set it up. And... Uh, there was a, he did the, did the radio ad. And the important thing about the radio ad was there was, it was a presidential election. Ronald Reagan was running against Jimmy Carter. I think there was a U.S. Senate race. There was just a lot of clutter to try to get your message through. And we didn't have the money in those days that candidates have today. Try to get your message through. It was impossible. I had this radio ad with Bob Prince coming on, telling the people why they should vote for Mike Fisher for state Senate. And it was the best radio ad I think that anybody's had in political time. And uh, I'll never forget, I was standing hand at the polls on Election Day in Mount Lebanon. I remember right where I was at Hoover School. And this was a tough race. I mean, I, I went, we only won by a few thousand votes. John Staggerwald, who I've never met, had never met at that point, walked up to me. 
walked through the door. I shook my hand and introduced myself to him, and he said, I'm voting for you because the gunner's for you. And there were more people that told me they voted for me because of the gunner was for me. And it was sort of brought, you know, the local touch in as opposed to the political touch. He was quite a man. Um, I asked you about campaigning a moment ago. What's the secret to being successful as a campaigner? It's changed. Back, in, back when I was in elected office, it really was... Uh, it really was trying to get around and meeting as many people as you could and, and not being political. Uh, that might sound strange, but, uh, you know, this, uh, in, the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, early 2000s when I was running, uh, the, the Republicans and Democrats weren't quite as divided, I don't think, as they are today. And you had to talk to people, and they didn't care wh how, what party you were a member of. Uh, they want to know what you're going to do to help your, their community. And so you had to meet them, you had to build up trust, and uh, that, that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I tried to conduct my affairs in a very uh, uh, nonpartisan, bipartisan fashion. And uh, uh, as you build up trust, you had to have a good, uh, you had to have a good cadre of supporters. Uh, all across the community to, to win. Today, it's, it's more about who can raise the most money and who can get the, you know, the best television ads. But you still have to have that foundation. You still have to have that foundation. I know the new members who in both the House and Senate in our area you know, are trying to do that, but it's, it's a little bit different. Um, you know I'm a student of presidential history. I, I love to read about presidents. I, I love to uh, hear stories about presidents. Uh, and I always would, would, would bug you about your experience with, with George W. Bush. Uh, you had an opportunity to travel with him a little bit, didn't you? I did. I did. Uh, I had met his father, but I didn't really know George H. W. Bush. But George W. Bush, uh, he, he had a nickname for everybody, and my nickname with him was Mikey. He, every time he said he'd call me Mikey. Uh, and he came in and campaigned. Uh, I campaigned for him. He came in and campaigned for me a couple times. I uh, uh, rode in the presidential limousine, both in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, with George W. Bush. Uh, I never got on Air Force One. I kept telling Rick Santorum he had to get me on Air Force One. I never got on that one. Uh, but uh, I made the presidential limousine, which was uh, pretty great. Uh, but George W. Bush was a terrific guy. He really was. And, you know, at the time during his presidency, he had, you know, he was there you know, a year and uh, less than a year into his presidency came 9-11. And uh, that, that really changed the man, would have changed any, anybody. But, uh, you know, he, he was uh, ridiculed at times. A lot of people made fun of him. Uh, but I think today he's a lot more revered than uh, he, he was at the time. And I think in, he'll go down as one of America's great presidents. Uh, his history will tell it. When you were riding in the presidential limousine, were, were the conversations between you and President Bush about the campaign? Or, yes. Or about, about the campaign. He'd ask you about Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, and uh, he, I remember the one time we were talking, we were riding from the airport to an event that he was going to do in Green Tree before we went to a fundraiser in Pittsburgh. He came in for me. And they were going to honor the, uh, the miners from the Q Creek mine disaster that occurred in uh, 2002. So he was asking me for background on that. I mean, he was well on top of it. But uh, he would ask for background. And uh, uh, I'll never forget one little tidbit. We were riding, and he pulled out his cell phone, got on, he called somebody. And, in his office. He said, uh, can you put Condi on the phone for me? I thought, that's pretty cool. He just called for Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> and I'm sitting here next to him. And uh, uh, he, he said, uh, uh, yeah, she wasn't there. He said, well, have her call me back. You know, just very casual, just matter of fact, you know, just a very down to earth person. And uh, we were very fortunate to have him as our president. Mike, tell us about the family. Uh, what are Brett and Michelle doing now? And about how many well, grandchildren do you have? We have four. Each has two, uh, and uh, they're doing great. Uh, 
uh, and we're very, we're very fortunate, Carol and I are very fortunate. Uh, both of our children live within, uh, you know, 10 minutes of us. And I know the two of you have uh, uh, grandchildren and children who were spread further apart across the country. But we're very fortunate to have our children and grandchildren right here. What's Brett doing? Uh, Brett's in the uh, uh, payment processing business with Pineapple Payments here in Pittsburgh. And Michelle uh, is a state government. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. She's a state government lobbyist for UPMC, a little company that some people have heard of. <laughs> yeah. Did you expect either of your children might go into politics? Uh, I never pushed them that way, but it's, it's no surprise. And uh, Michelle's always been interested in it. And Brett, too, but uh, he's out trying to make some money to support the family. And your grandson recently got a hole-in-one. He did. Cam. Cam Reyes, Michelle's son at age 10 at Chartiers. Knocked one in a hole, 160 yards. It was unbelievable. It was on tape because... His dad, Alex, was, uh, they were playing in a father and son event, and Alex decided to tape his swing, and lo and behold, the ball went right in the hole. And I told him the next day, I said, Cam, I've had two hole-in-ones, but they've been 35 years apart, so I don't think you're going to get one every year. <laughs> You'll probably make me wrong and get, me, get one next year. Well, Mike, um, congratulations. You're a federal judge, which that in itself is a monumentous uh, – achievement and uh, on a personal note that there's been a several banquets where I've been uh, honored I guess and you have always been there and said some very very nice complimentary things and so I appreciate your career and I appreciate your friendship well thanks Jim and as I said it uh, the last time was I said Jim Render really helped to put Upper St. Clair on the map and he really did with uh, his success uh, with that high school football program and and all you did for those young men who came well, through that thank program. Thank you. You've helped put the place on the map too, I would say. When you, I, I would agree with that. Yes, <laughs> indeed. And in addition to being a federal judge, you're also doing some teaching at Pitt. I do teach at Pitt Law, and I enjoy that. Keeps me on my toes to see those young law students coming through. And uh, so uh, I'm staying active. I'm not. I'm not retiring. And I stay active and try to. Uh, you know, it's it, it's great opportunity. It's great to be a member of the U.S. Court of Appeals, and uh, I enjoy what I'm doing. And that means too, you can't campaign anymore, right? Out of politics. Out of politics. Out of politics. Out of politics is nothing Republican or Democrat anymore. It's just uh, you apply the law to the facts. I'm sure your folks would be very proud of you. Well. I'm happy to have had a great career, lived in a great community, and known a lot of great people like yourselves. And thank you for what you've done, Lanny. Michael, thank you very much for being with us today on the program 15241 Today Talk with the federal judge, Michael Fisher. Thanks for joining us, folks.